from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, the chips are down. Shares of semiconductor companies plunging to start the week after new U.S. curves on China's access to American technology. Where is the industry's downturn headed? We will discuss. Plus, it's not just chip stocks at risk. Both the IMF and the World Bank are warning of a potential global recession. This as tech earnings kick off next week. We're going to preview what to expect. And the markets have spoken about the Twitter deal as well. Investors seem to see about a 60% chance that Elon Musk's deal closes by October 28th. What will become of the social media platform once that happens? We will explore that this hour. All that in a moment, but first I want to get a look at the markets with U.S. stocks falling for a fourth day as investors brace for more Fed policy tightening, geopolitical risks also looming large. Bloomberg's Taylor Riggs here for a breakdown. Taylor, walk us through the day. Yeah, and Lisa, we'll just start sort of a broad picture here. You can see that really every sort of indice was under pressure. The S&P off about one, seven tenths of one percent, eight tenths of one percent there. But of course, big tech, certainly the big underperformer, the second worst performer within the S&P 500 after energy. So that narrative of tech under pressure, that continued today. The SOX index, which I know that you mentioned some of the big chip makers, and I know that you'll do a lot more on that show, the clear underperformers. As you also mentioned, it has now been four straight days of a big tech, the NASDAQ 100, now off about 5.7%, four straight days in a row. Now, I wish I could blame the bond market, but that was closed today. So even though the trend has been yields higher, which does impact big tech the most. Today we got a reprieve a little bit from that narrative. Uh, let's just sort of recap and take a look at this terminal chart. When I think about sort of the SOX index and Emily, I won't sort of give too many details here, but when we think about the traditional Dow theory, the gauge of the economy, we have Dow relative to the S&P 500, but now it's actually the SOX, those chip makers relative to the S&P 500. And that underperformance, when we think about the new economy, has been sort of the big problem, as you can see there with those chip makers and really the new sort of bite economy under pressure uh, that'll sort of give you some good fodder for the rest of the show. All right, Taylor, thanks for walking us through all that. We will see what tomorrow brings. Appreciate you stopping by. I want to stick to the chip story now. Chip stocks down. Their lowest since 2020. Joining us now, Wu Jin Ho, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst for Hardware and Networking. So a disappointing start, uh, Wu Jin Ho, uh, ahead of you know, what could be a potentially difficult earnings season. We've already, already had these warnings from AMD and from Samsung. Where is this going? Sure. I think, thanks, Emily. So, so um, I, I think the AMD as well as the Samsung warnings uh, is a precursor to what we may potentially see for earnings season uh, for the upcoming earnings season. I think the, the risk here is is not on the consumer side. I think uh, the consumer concerns on the PC side um, has already been factored in. I, I think the bigger risk going through into earnings season is this going to affect the the enterprise side on, on the chip side? We haven't seen that yet. And, but if we look at the AMD data center numbers, they weren't as strong as people had hoped. They were more in line than anything else. And, and the concern is, is that it's going to affect more uh, chip makers on the data center and cloud side. So is the chip downturn far from over? I mean, is it just starting? It, it potentially could be, right? If we start thinking about uh, enterprise spending going going forward, uh, if there is a downturn going to the 2022 and 2023, then then there is that risk of downward earnings revisions to reflect uh, the weakness on, on the enterprise side uh, of the ledger, right? Um, I still don't have a good crystal ball on where the, the PC sector is going to bottom out. And I think we're going to have to start uh, seeing uh, where the, uh, the enterprise side is going to uh, flesh out as well. Now, of course, these you know, new round of, of American curves on China's access to U.S. technology, how could that um, you know, potentially make a, a bad situation worse? And, and how does that play out over the longer term? 
Sure. I, I don't think it's going to be a near-term impact. If, if anything, it's going to be a longer-term impact. Uh, the ban or, or the curbs on the AI side isn't anything new. This is something that AMD as well as NVIDIA hinted at at um, uh, one of their 8K filings uh, uh, back in September. And this makes it more official than anything else. And I believe AMD as well as NVIDIA said the impact will be minimal because they could still sell lesser uh, 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 lesser powered uh, AI chips uh, to, to China. Now, now that being said, I, I do think that the uh, the U.S. do uh, does want to uh, send in broader curbs uh, to slow down uh, China's development uh, of uh, not only the use of AI chips but also the manufacture of AI chips. Uh, there were some developments by by SMIC of introducing seven nanometer chips. I think that put a scare. Uh, in, into the U.S. and they want to slow down anything that China can do to develop some of these uh, higher powered uh, 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 chips going forward. So it doesn't sound like you think we're heading towards a total ban, but you know, is that a possibility? Well, uh, let, let's let's use um, well, let's use Huawei as, as an example, uh, as well as ETE. Uh, there is an entity list that they're on, uh, and. Um, at the end of the day, uh, Huawei's uh, smartphone business essentially has um, pretty much died. All right, uh, if if there there is a an entity list that the U.S. has started to uh, beef up, and uh, we might start seeing uh, some of these uh, lesser known Chinese memory companies as well as chip manufacturing companies uh, fall into that entity. If that's going to be the case. Then, then there might be a, a, a dent into the China, uh, China's chip manufacturing uh, uh, initiatives going forward. So, I mean, we'll, case we still have to see where this will go, but uh, that still may happen. All right. Well, a lot of red for chips to start the week. Uh, Wu Jin Ho, Bloomberg Intelligence senior analyst. Thank you so much for stopping by. Now, speaking of China, we're following the COVID situation there as well. Tallies rising and fears of a potential lockdown returning once again. The country reported 1,887 cases for Sunday, the highest since August 20th, and Shanghai posted the most new local infections in almost three months. Officials saying anyone traveling to Shanghai will need a negative COVID result within 24 hours of arriving in the city and will have to do three tests in three days. Coming up. A bit more than a coin toss. Cowan analyst pricing in a 60% chance that Elon Musk's deal with Twitter gets done by the deadline. We're going to dig into the odds next. This is Bloomberg. we've had of Elon Musk's vision for Twitter include potentially becoming part of what he calls X, the everything app, which brings to mind the Chinese app WeChat. Quick Takes Alex Webb talked to us about the obstacles Twitter will face if it tries to become more like WeChat. Take a listen. Elon Musk's $44 billion deal to buy Twitter is back on, and it comes with an interesting wrinkle, turning the social media company into a so-called super app. Now, this is what the Chinese company WeChat has really pioneered. It's a portal in China for everything from dating apps to paying your bills, ordering food and getting taxis. But it hasn't really succeeded in Europe and the US, and there are often three obstacles. Firstly, you need to have a payment layer, something that connects all of the apps together and makes it easy to pay in one quick action. Secondly, you need to have a lot of developers. Twitter has about 200 million users, but there are about 1.8 billion active users of Apple devices and 3 billion active users of Android devices. If you're a developer or a company looking to build a product, it's pretty clear which of those three services you're likely to prioritize. And finally, there is the regulatory consideration. If you are a company that leverages its strength in one service to build strength in a different one, that is not something that regulators, particularly in Europe, look too kindly upon. But it also comes with a slight problem. Either you are not big enough for developers to have the scale that they want to build apps and services for your product, or if you do have the scale, you're going to attract that regulatory attention. Perhaps Elon is the person who can make this happen, but it does come with a lot of obstacles. Quick takes, Alex Webb there, sticking with 
Twitter merger arbitrage strategists at Cowan say the market is pricing in just a bit more than the odds of a coin toss that Elon Musk's deal with Twitter will close by the court-issued deadline of October 28th. Here to tell us more about the latest, Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner, who has, has of course, been covering this whole saga for us. We're going to get to the WeChat thing in a moment, Kurt, but what do you make yeah. of this whole 60% chance thing, especially given uh, you know, nothing's of... been a sure thing to this point? <laughs> yeah. I was trying to think of something clever about fool me once, you know, whatever. But it, to me, it feels higher than 60% simply because, you know, both sides are showing up. They want the same deal, right? They want the same price. At least that's what they say. And now a judge has said, okay, you have till the 28th to do this. And a lot of the stuff, getting debt financing in order, for example, getting shareholder approval, that's all done, right? So they say they want the same deal. They say uh, that all the stuff that they need to do to get that done is essentially done. So I feel like it's got to be higher than 60%, Emily. But, uh, you know, what, what do I know? I feel like we've been talking about this for six months and, and it keeps changing. So. Well, right. What do any of us know? Uh, well, Elon Musk knows, or at least he has said, he wants to make Twitter part of this everything app vision. What does that mean to you? How do you interpret that? Does it sound to you like WeChat? It sounds a lot like WeChat, um, and it's not necessarily a bad idea because WeChat is incredibly popular in China, and we've seen other companies, mostly Facebook, try to do this as well. Where I think it's an issue is that, as Alex said in kind of the intro you showed, Twitter just doesn't have the scale that's needed for, for something like this, right? And most of uh, what makes WeChat so valuable, I think, is that it's also the place where people do all of their communication, right? It's not just where you get your Uber or you order your food delivery. It's where you're talking with mom and dad and grandma and your boss and, and your cousins. And like Twitter is not that place, right? There, it is not a place that people are hanging out. And so for me, the idea of suddenly turning into a place where everyone is hanging out and suddenly doing their shopping, uh, it just doesn't really make sense. Again, I like the idea and concept because uh, it, see, it clearly works in China. I just don't think that this is going to happen for Twitter. Now, it is ambitious, and if anyone can do it right, you would say, all right, well, maybe Elon Musk is that person. But Mark Zuckerberg's tried to meta a few times, and it's not happening there either. So speaking of scale, how are you thinking about potential staffing changes once Musk presumably takes over the company? You know, is there going to be a mass exodus? Is there going to be an influx of, of you know, Elon Musk's fans who want to work for him? You know, clearly the size that the company is can't necessarily handle, like you said, the scale of a social media platform the right. size of WeChat. Well, I can tell you what I know, and then I can speculate a little bit. What I know is that a lot of people inside Twitter are currently worried for their jobs, right? They uh, expect Elon to come in and do layoffs. They expect him to essentially kind of clean the executive ranks, um, you know, certainly CEO Prague Agarwal, probably the head lawyer Vijay Gotti. And, you know, this is uh, something that happens a lot of times during an acquisition, but I think especially now, because Elon has basically said he doesn't have confidence or faith in those leaders, right? So this is, this is what people are bracing for. Now, what he does next is going to be a, a good question. Is he going to trim the company down and simply keep it sort of the engineers, bare bones, folks who are going to build product? Or if he wants to do this kind of super app thing he's talking about, he's going to need partnerships people. He's going to need probably content people, like moderation people, right? Which is, is something that he has kind of shied away from. And so that's where I think things get a little tricky is, uh, you know, the, the, the financial vision for the company seems to be let's cut everything back and, and maybe, you know, get healthy, as he likes to say. Um, but the vision is much more... Uh, ambitious than that, and I'm not sure that necessarily works with that small of a staff. All right, uh, lots to continue to follow, Kurt. I know you'll be all over it. Thank you for the updates. I want to get a quick check on another story that we're following, which is several airport websites in the U.S. were knocked offline by a pro-Russia hacktivist group. Chicago's O'Hare and LAX, among the websites hacked, the group called Killnet has been linked to a series of cyber attacks against Western targets, including disruptions to some state government websites last week. Coming up, we're going to talk about the state of the cosmetics industry as consumers have moved online. Our exclusive interview with the team from Curology. Coming up next, this is Bloomberg. <music> Curology 
the cosmetics company that provides prescription skincare customized to patient skin, has grown at lightning speed over the last few years with revenue for 2022 projected at over $200 million. The company is now profitable and announcing changes to its C-suite to prepare for the next phase. Dr. David Lorscher, co-founder of Curology, stepped down as CEO to pass the torch to Heather Wallace, who was most recently president at Revlon. They're both joining me now for more on the transition. So David, I want to start with you. Give us some background on the transition here and who popped the question and how. Thank you, Emily. That would be me who popped the question. And the reason is that the <laughs> skills you need to successfully found a company are just very different than the skills you need to take an established company like Curology and grow it to its full potential. And so, you know, right now, the company's in this incredible position for the future because, um, like you said, we became profitable and we really have the ability to invest. And so my goal is just to find someone to help take us to that next level. And I just couldn't be more excited to be able to have found Heather here. Heather, given what you learned recently at Revlon, what's your vision for the company and you know, what you know about what's going on in, in the beauty world, especially given that we are moving into potentially a pretty pronounced downturn? So, I, I mean, a couple things. One is I, I'm so excited, excited to be joining Curology and Curology is actually doing what many beauty companies are talking about, which is personalization. So it's truly personal, personalized skincare, we are connecting people with dermatology providers that cr create custom formulas, and we can service those consumers and really help them have better skin outcomes. And so people, your face is the way that you face the world. And so how you look and how your face looks uh, really has a big impact on your confidence, on how you feel, um, and, and truly a big impact in your life. So I'm excited about that with Curology. Now, you know, in terms of what's I, happening with the economy, I think we're, we all are concerned about that. This is an incredibly resilient category. Um, and I do expect us to be able to do very well during this time period. I 100% agree that good skincare is vital, but how much do you think people are really gonna be spending on themselves right now when they're spending more on everything from gas to groceries? I mean. Isn't that the first thing to go, you? It, it's actually not. Um, there are many things that go before skincare. So I've actually seen data over time on um, what happens during challenging economic times, and skincare is one of the most resilient categories. At the end of the day, as you say, you know, you're going to work, you're in front of friends and family, you're putting your best face forward, and it is very important. And so I do expect consumers to still spend in this area. David, the cult of the founder is so strong, and especially in Silicon Valley. And I'm wondering if you've, you've been pretty straightforward about why you're doing this. And now, do you think too many founders stay too long and that more founders should leave potentially sooner? Every company is different, but but I do believe that you know the decision to pass the baton, as you say, to someone like Heather should actually be made a lot more commonly because ultimately what we care about is getting our business to that next level. And the same person to successfully found a company isn't necessarily the right person to get you to that next level. So, so I do think there's, um, um, there, there's a lot of merit in that. Um, Heather, I, I know that Revlon recently uh, filed for bankruptcy. They're talking about supply chain issues. Curious if you're expecting to deal with some of those similar issues at Curology, especially as it pertains to the supply chain and what you learned there that you can potentially apply here and head off some of these challenges. Yeah, so I think when it comes to Curology, our supply chain is really focused in the US. And so it's much more simple. Uh, we are providing products end to end, but it's a much more simple supply chain. So the other thing I know is that just keeping us focused so keeping us focused on the right and the core of the products and being able to continue to do our personalization and our customized formulas at scale is going to be where the focus is. So let's talk a little bit more about that. What's your hope for the next chapter of growth given the rise in direct consumer skincare, the rise in personalization, as you say, the rise in subscription services, but also the fact that we're, you know, some people might be paying for a few different subscription services um, you know, at one time, how do you, how do you see balance, you know, consumers balancing all of that and Curology winning out? So the company was founded on the mission of access that consumers should have access to the kind of 
skincare solutions that the best dermatologists can provide. And so as we think about growth in the future, it's all going to be about continued awareness and access to those providers. And the more access and awareness that we can create, the more consumers we can bring in. We're the, lar the largest player in the personalized skincare space. Uh, but we are relatively small at this point compared to the $20 billion facial skincare market in the U.S. David, what are you hoping to see in this next chapter and how involved will you be? I will be stepping into the position of a uh, board chairperson. And, you know, ultimately the most important thing is that Curology succeeds. And so I'm going to be helping in every way, that, any way that I can. Um, but, you know, the biggest thing for me is that we have this, this really huge opportunity in front of us because I think if you talk to almost anybody who's used Curology, they will tell you there's no way I'm going back to using what I used before. Uh, but when you take a step back and look at the market, about 95 plus percent of people are still using non-personalized, less effective skincare. And so what I really do hope to see is just us being able to continue to spearhead the market shifting towards the more effective, personalized type of skincare that the best dermatologists provide. And speaking of the market, Heather, I mean, are you thinking about an IPO in, in, you know, in terms of the next phase of growth? You know, who, who knows what the future will bring? I think we're going to be focused on profitable growth and reaching more consumers with our fantastic customized solutions. Um, and the better skin, the more better skin outcomes uh, that will just unlock the future possibilities. All right, Heather Wallace, the new CEO of Curology, and Dr. David Lorscher, co-founder of Curology, moving into the role of chair. Thank you both for joining us. All right, coming up, growing fears of a global recession. What does it mean for tech stocks and upcoming tech earnings? We will talk about that. Plus, electric expansion. Amazon set to spend more than a billion euros to grow its EV fleet across Europe. We're gonna have the details on that investment next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. I want to turn back to the markets as heads of the IMF and the World Bank warn of a rising risk of global recession. This with advanced economy slowing down and faster inflation forcing the Fed to keep raising interest rates. What does it mean for tech stocks and tech earnings? Coming up, I want to break that all down with Michael Casper of Bloomberg Intelligence. So what do you make of uh, the, the macro environment? What's happening here and what it means for tech stocks, Michael? Yeah, the macro environment is still somewhat strong for what it is a technical recession right now. Um, just to give you some context around the S&P earnings at large, we were looking at about a 2.5% expansion uh, in 3Q. It's still an expansion, um, and that's going to be the trough, or at least looks like it's going to be the trough, at least according to consensus, um, for this earnings cycle. And specifically with tech stocks, uh, tech is looking to have about a 7.5% earnings contraction that's only second worst to uh, communications and financials, which are tied with a 12.1% decline. Um, and some of the tech stocks are specifically some of the industries look to be uh, under pressure here, given the rising dollar and some of the supply chain concerns that linger. Now, the World Bank is saying there's a real danger of worldwide contraction. You've got Jamie Dimon saying markets going to fall another 20%. What's your own research showing? Uh, well, we're seeing much lighter contraction, right? So if you uh, use our fair value model and, and use September's low as the price and try to back into what earnings contraction was priced by the market, you're looking at about a 5 to 15% EPS decline uh, that was priced in by that September low. And the, the varying scenarios have to do with the differing rates that uh, drive PEs, right? So if you get a 5% expansion um, or 5% interest rate, 
you're looking at uh, about a 5% earnings drop to accompany that. And by the way, that would be pretty much right in line with the narrowest uh, earnings drop that we've had across all the recessions historically back to 1960, um, in line with that 1980 recession, which coincidentally was a very you know inflationary period as well. So we've got a raft of tech earnings coming out next week. Uh, Netflix will be kicking us off. Of course, we've got you know all the big tech companies quickly to follow. What are you looking at and what are you expecting? Uh, I'm looking at the outlooks uh, for companies, especially the mega caps. Right now, the mega caps are expected to have about a 2% earnings increase on median, so the top five uh, tech and tech-related stocks. Tesla, I, I threw Tesla in there. Um, and that would be the worst uh, going back to 1Q2016. So I'm watching the outlooks on those mega cap stocks. Within tech, uh, I think semis is particularly interesting given, given the chip news today, um, limiting exports to China. And that uh, industry is forecast for about a 14% decline. So there's still lingering supply chain issues there. There's the pressure from the uh, latest announcement from the Biden administration. And semis looks to be under some uh, considerable pressure here. You know, how do you think whatever we see from these uh, earnings it could set the tone for the rest of the year? I mean, given what we're seeing in chip stocks, not good so far. If we continue to get some more bad signals, I mean, you know, does that spell doom and gloom? Uh, yeah, it wouldn't necessarily be good, uh, especially considering if you're looking at the S&P 500 as a whole. Uh, tech and discretionary stocks are supposed to lead the way out of this uh, kind of mild earnings recession that we're having right now. Um, and, you know, if, if that doesn't materialize, at least on the tech side, which is a huge driver, I mean, we're talking about 22% uh, of the index that's in those top five uh, stocks. If we're looking at some weakness in tech stocks, it will translate overall to weakness in the S&P 500. Um, but so far, I, I will say, at least on the earnings front, companies have done a pretty good job making the best out of a bad situation with margins. All right, Michael. Well, thanks for giving us your view. And good to hear someone who's a little bit more optimistic than others. Michael Kaspar of Bloomberg Intelligence. Appreciate it. Meantime, another story that we are watching, shares of Rivian declined after the EV maker said it'll recall about 13,000 vehicles delivered to customers after discovering a minor structural defect with a nut that could loosen fully in, quote, rare circumstances. The company said it's recalling almost all the vehicles delivered to customers, even though the issue was discovered only in seven out of an abundance of caution. And speaking of EVs, Amazon just announced it'll spend a billion euros over five years to electrify its delivery fleet in Europe. That money will be used to double the number of EVs in Europe to 10,000 vans and 1,500 electric heavy goods vehicles, or so they call them. Bloomberg Spencer Soper, who covers Amazon for us, uh, is here with more. So what is Amazon hoping to accomplish, Spencer, with this announcement? Yeah, so basically Amazon's sending a message to the market, uh, you know, start producing more EV vehicles because uh, Amazon can't find enough of them. Um, and your recent your uh, segment that you just had about Rivian in particular shows they don't like to be wholly dependent on one particular company as well. So they buy from Rivian, they buy from Mercedes. They want more people in the market producing these things, and they just want more of these electric vehicles produced uh, you know, as, as a bottom line. Electric cars fit into Amazon's plans to get to uh, net zero by 2040? Yeah, so Amazon really hasn't said precisely how it's going to do this. It's a very lofty goal, you know, net zero emissions by 2040, but their most visible thing has been electric vehicles. They're on the road, you see them, um, and they're going to have to address a lot of other things in their company, like, uh, you know, airplanes and ocean liners and those sorts of things that are still very uh, fuel heavy, but their uh, electric vehicles is really the predominant part piece of their of their push so far. And so talk to us about uh, the other parts or the other potential parts of their push. How else are they going to get to net zero? Yeah, there, there were some interesting things in this announcement in Europe where they even talked about making deliveries, you know, on electric bicycles and even by foot. And they also talked about expanding their network in Europe, their uh, warehouse network in Europe. And I think they're also sending a message with that as well, that they want to make sure that it's particularly if it's a delivery station, 
They want to make sure that it's equipped with charging stations for any type of of uh, you know non um, or low emissions vehicles that they that they might be using. They want to make sure that the infrastructure that they have, not just the vehicles they have, but the infrastructure they have, is capable of charging these things. And how is what they're doing in Europe compared? Uh, how does it compare to what they have done so far in the United States? I mean, it pretty much is the same is the same model. Um, you know, just a big investment in electric vehicles. But this is the biggest announcement they've made by far in Europe. So they're trying to send a message to Europe, say, listen, what we've been doing in the U.S., we're going to be doing the same thing, same thing in Europe and following the same playbook. All right. Spencer Soper, uh, always good to have you with us. Thank you, Spencer, for those updates. Thumbs up. All right, coming up, the long crypto winter. How much longer is it going to last? And what do we make of all the recent crypto CEO and other executive departures? We're going to talk about that and more with Hunter Horsley, Bitwise Asset Management CEO. That's next. This is Bloomberg. For our crypto report, and as global markets are awaiting U.S. inflation data Thursday, I want to take a look at the global wave of monetary tightening to fight inflation and how it's spurred a near 60% slide in Bitcoin this year. Will Bitcoin break its $20,000 mark anytime soon? I want to ask Hunter Horsley about that and more. He's the CEO of Bitwise Asset Management. Hunter, good to have you back. So let's start on markets. What's your read as we head into the fourth quarter? And there seems to be just more and more bad news. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a tumultuous year in markets broadly and and certainly certainly in crypto. I think the current you know recent numbers this year, the Nasdaq's down over thirty percent, S and P's down, and crypto's down sixty percent or thereabouts. It's changing every day. So the story of this year is definitely a bear market. Uh, nevertheless, we've seen increased interest from, from our, our client base. And I think that the, the backdrop for many crypto investors investors is that uh, there uh, historically have been four-year cycles. Uh, and while there are opportunities to make money in many moments of the crypto market, uh, bear market moments are the moments where fortunes can be made. And so there are some that are positioning themselves in the current bear market um, and uh, and coming into the space now. So what do you think it'll mean for crypto ultimately? Does Bitcoin break that $20,000 mark, for example? Yeah, you know, I, I can't say for sure about, about 20,000. Um, and certainly it's a space with, with quite a bit of volatility. But the historical pattern uh, of crypto with the data we have, you know, about 12 years uh, of a journey, is that we get four-year cycles we get three years of bull markets with growing momentum, and then we get a bear market year. So 2014, the market down almost 60%. 2018, the market down north of 70%. And this year, obviously, the market down in 2022, around 60%. The expectation, if the market you know, continues its historical trend, would be that we begin a new cycle uh, next year. And so wherever we wind up this year, uh, a lot of investors are thinking about how that positions them uh, for the next cycle. You're out with a new Web3 fund that'll give retail investors exposure to companies across Web3 uh, finance, the metaverse, the creator economy. As we barrel into a recession, what makes you think investors are going to jump on board? Yeah, so at, at Bitwise, we view our role as helping investors understand and access the opportunities in crypto. And certainly, there are a wide range of important things going on in the world today outside of this space. But it's our job to stay focused on this space specifically. We've been doing it for five years. We work with over a 1,000 financial advisors, branches, uh, and institutions. And what we saw with BWeb uh, was an emerging uh, category of opportunity around the established innovators, established companies who are positioned to benefit from the rise of Web3, from the environment created by crypto. 
And so we view it as our job to recognize worthwhile opportunities and open up access to those. Uh, and so that's why we uh, we introduced uh, we introduced the Web3 uh, product. And in general today, there's there's quite a wide aperture uh, of different areas that investors see opportunity in the crypto markets. Uh, quite different from you know even even uh, when when we started the firm, and the story was mostly just about uh, just about Bitcoin. Now there have been a number of high high profile crypto executive departures, CEOs, uh, the CFO of OpenSea recently left. What do you think's behind all of this? You know, I think zooming out, it, it's a it's a difficult time in the economy, and crypto is not bigger than that. It's not excluded from that, and in fact, you know, crypto is more volatile in general. And so I think it's natural to expect uh, that you would see. That you would see turnover and that you would see uh, adjustments uh, with the firms in the space. We've been around for five years, uh, and in that period of time alone, have seen many, many of the players change. Um, I think it's a healthy part of the progression and the maturation of the space. But in thinking about what it means for the average, uh, the average investor who's interested in the space doesn't have a ton of time to uh, uh, to focus on on everything that's going on day to day. I, I think the, the real the real learning of 2022 is that it's starting to really matter who you work with or what platform you use uh, or what app you use. And not all of these things uh, are created equal. Uh, I think in 2021, there was a sense that if you invested in something, it didn't really matter where you bought it or how you bought it. You had a, you had a shot at, uh, at a great return. Uh, I think this year, what's becoming more clear is that it matters, it matters who you're working with or uh, what service you're using uh, to invest. So I think that that is the implication of this uh, for most investors is paying attention to, to who you're working with. Now, I'd love for you to put your social media hat on for a moment. You used to work at Facebook and Instagram earlier in your career. I'm sure you've been following the uh, Twitter Musk saga to a certain extent. Elon Musk and, and Jack Dorsey, we now know from their text, uh, you know, talked about making Twitter an open source protocol. Uh, what do you think about a decentralized vision for Twitter? And if something like that is really possible? I think it's possible. Uh, I think it's exciting. And I think it's an experiment we're going to see uh, play out in the next, in the immediate term future. Uh, in fact, there's a, there's a project called Farcaster that's already attempting to build uh, a Web3 version uh, of Twitter where uh, you can have a similar communication experience, um, but you don't worry about the sort of corporate policy and the moderation policy uh, uh, because the information is on a blockchain and then the app uh, just pulls information from that blockchain. So I think the game is afoot on this one. And I think zooming out, it's, it's sort of indicative of the moment we're at in the crypto space and with Web3, which is there are now a huge amount of developers, there's great funding, uh, there's proven technology, and I think over the next two years, you're going to see a, a big wave of attempts to build uh, consumer applications, uh, to build services that people use. Um, and I, I think I think the Twitter scenario uh, is is front and center as as one of those in Web three. So it sounds like you see this pretty clearly. Can you explain what this actually looks like and how how do how do things change for the average Twitter user? What happens to yeah. crypto Twitter, for example, if everything is decentralized? I think you know some people just don't understand. Like, what are they? What do they really mean? <laughs> here's here's the mental model I'd offer. Uh, in the current world, uh, your followers, your 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 audience is only available on Twitter. So whatever Twitter does is law. Uh, and sometimes that, that is, a, is a, a downside for certain users. The decentralized Web3 version, I don't know exactly what it'll look like, but it'll look something more like the way you think about your email, which is if you're not happy with Gmail, you can move to AOL. If you're not happy with AOL and you want certain features, you can move to Superhuman uh, and so on and so forth. You can take your email address, you can take your, your, your contact book with you uh, and you can go somewhere else if you don't like the way that the app uh, is being built or uh, the policies of the app. And so that's, that's what people are striving for here when you hear people say a Web3 version of something. 
similar to the dynamic uh, and power structure that exists with email, they want to introduce that to more parts of our life. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think you could use that as an analogy for uh, how uh, it might change certain services like Twitter. Interesting. Uh, well, thanks for uh, humoring us there. Uh, Hunter Horsley, CEO of Bitwise Asset Management, would love to have you back uh, sooner rather than later. Hunter, thank you for stopping by. Coming up, charging changes. Apple shift its charging port on the iPhone to USB-C to abide by a new European law, even as it moves forward with plans for a wireless future. We're gonna break that all down next. This is Bloomberg. Apple is set to shift from the lightning charging port on the iPhone and other devices to USB-C to abide by a new European law. What does this mean for the company's wireless first future? Let's bring in Mark German for more. So let's let's rewind a little bit because when they changed that lightning charging port, it was a little traumatic uh, for some people. What exactly is Apple doing now and what does it mean for iPhone users? Uh, that's right, Emily. So for most of the 2000s, right, Apple had what was called the 30-pin iPod connector. That worked on all their main iPods, and it was also the connector that was on the iPhone until the iPhone 5. In 2012, with the 5, Apple moved to Lightning. It's much smaller, it's reversible, it's all digital. It made sense as things were shifting more wirelessly, right? But now we're getting to the point where USB-C is taking over the tech industry. And now the European Union is pushing USB-C because it's interoperable between Android devices from Samsung, from Google, as well as Apple devices. Right now, the iPhone still uses Lightning. That means you can't use the same charger to charge your iPhone as you can even with your iPad Pro or your MacBook Pro or your Android device. So because of some prodding from the European Union and because it just makes sense for consumers and its ecosystem, Apple will move to USB-C next year in 2023 with the iPhone 15. They'll also move it to some of their Mac accessories that still use Lightning, some of their iPhone accessories like the MagSafe battery that use Lightning, and probably most critically the AirPods, which also still use Lightning. So overall, it's a very good move uh, for consumers, I think. What does it mean, though, given that Apple really wants us ultimately to not have to use any wires at all? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So 2017, about five years ago, Apple announced a device called the AirPower. What that was was a three-device charging mat from the company. It was announced in 2017, was supposed to go on sale in 2018, and it would allow you to inductively charge an iPhone, AirPods, and the Apple Watch at the same time. Many technical issues I won't belabor right now, that never launched. But Apple still wants to push users towards wireless charging. The latest MacBooks, they all use MagSafe charging, right? You don't stick an actual cable into the device, but it uses somewhat of a magnetic inductive charger called MagSafe. The iPhone has MagSafe charging, the Apple Watch has MagSafe charging, the AirPods have MagSafe charging. So while the Lightning connector and the iPod 30 pin connector before that both lasted about 10, 11 years for their respective ecosystems, I think USB-C is going to be the Apple connector for the next five years, and then we'll see a much bigger push to inductive charging, MagSafe, and wireless interoperability. All right, uh, Boomworks Mark German, uh, always appreciating you keeping us update uh, on all things Apple. Thank you so much for that. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Do not forget, you can check out the podcast anywhere you get your podcasts. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.